Welcome to the hidden corners where truth and terror collide. Discover a realm where the lines between the living and the supernatural blur as you embark on a journey to the paranormal and visit the mysterious hidden corners of your mind. This is part 18 of the Wolfman series, Russia and the Arctic. Luther is dead. I suppose that means there is no hope of a cure for me. Jack was sitting in front of the fire on the sofa of the luxurious ski condo that Sasha had rented, finally feeling like himself again. Sasha walked across the room with a plate of salami, cheese, and crackers and sat down next to Jack. I'm okay with that. I like snuggling with a big furry beast. Jack smiled and reached for the plate. He was starving after expending so much energy running from the snowmobiles that were chasing him through the forest. So, tell me what happened from from the beginning, Sasha said as she poured wine into both of their glasses. Alex met me at the door just as you said he would. He obviously didn't know that Catherine was gone. When we got to the laboratory room... There were two empty cages and a gurney in the middle of the room with tubes hanging from carts. There were empty vials on the table next to the gurney and a refrigerator nearby with vials of blood. Luther was crouching in a corner in full wolf form. I didn't know it was Luther at the time, but the wolf came at me and we fought. And it wasn't until I had wounded the wolf that I realized that it was Luther. And when Luther gained consciousness, he said the lab assistant had kidnapped Cat and the other two, Rebecca and her brother. That's all he knew. Alex told us we needed to leave immediately, and I decided to take Luther with me. I'm not sure why, but I thought he might be useful as leverage to finding Cat. I asked Alex to contact you or your brother to find out who this assistant is, and, and then we left. We are running through the forest, both of us in our wolf forms, when I realized we were lost. I was just about to find a place to shelter so I could return to my normal self and check for phone reception or messages from you when I heard the snowmobiles. Luckily, I was headed for the road, but Luther got shot when he tried to take a shortcut through the meadow. As soon as he was out of the safety of the trees, they shot him. I saw him try to get up, but they shot him again. So I kept on running, and that's when I found you. Thank God you were there, Sasha. I don't know that I could outrun him if I'd had to go much further. Sasha nodded. Yes, Alex called my brother, and we're running a search on the lab assistant right now. All we know is he is a wolf trainer from Mongolia. His mother is of the Nenet tribe of reindeer herders way up in the Arctic. I have no idea what he thinks he'll gain by taking him. From what we've been able to source, it doesn't appear that he's working for any government or underground agency. There's been no ransom requests, although it's still early for that. We will know more tomorrow. You can bet that everyone is on high alert by now. It will be difficult for them to hide and nearly impossible to cross any borders. They'll be found. I just hope our people find them first. Your people? What do you mean by that? Jack inquired. Jack, I haven't been quite honest with you about my involvement in all this. I told you that from the moment you set foot on that plane in Mexico, you've been watched. But I didn't exactly tell you the whole story. Sasha paused as she refilled their glasses. Go on, Jack said. Sasha took a deep breath. Russia has its allies and its enemies. Finland borders Russia for 830 miles and runs mostly through Tyaga forests and sparsely populated rural areas. And until recently, Finland has been a neutral neighbor to Russia. But after the Cold War, the possibility of membership with NATO became a topic of debate in Finland. Public support for joining NATO remained low until 2022, when Russia decided to invade Ukraine. That marked a turning point and swung public opinion in favor of NATO membership. And along with Sweden, Finland applied to join NATO in May of 2022. 
Following ratification, Finland became a member in April of 2023. Because of that, Russia's relationship with Finland has significantly deteriorated. You see, after Russia decided to invade Ukraine, Finland imposed sanctions on Russia, and Russia added all European countries to their list of unfriendly nations. Moscow now views its western neighbor as a hostile country, and the Finnish Security and Intelligence Service said in a national security review that Russia was prepared to take measures against Finland. My brother and I are part of an organization called Partnership for Peace. It's a NATO program aimed at creating trust and cooperation between the member states of NATO and other European states. We focus on military-to-military -military cooperation, on training exercises, disaster planning and response, science and environmental issues, professionalism, policy planning, and relations with civilian governments. Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea in 2014 and its unjustified and unprovoked attack on Ukraine are a sobering reminder of the importance of NATO's core task, collective defense. This, coupled with the Syrian conflict, the rise of ISIL, and the terrorism, and often homebred terrorism, has become a brutal reality that we're all facing. Cyber attacks are becoming ever more frequent and more destructive. And through social media and other means, the opponents of liberal open societies are spreading disinformation and propaganda that seek to undermine the values that NATO has always sought to protect and promote. When word got out about this secret, highly classified laboratory experiment involving turning soldiers into werewolves, you can bet we were interested. As far-fetched as it sounds, you know what this means to national security of any country, yours included? Well, we aim to stop it by any means necessary. All those vials of blood you and Alex saw in the laboratory, as soon as Alex ushered you and Luther out to the door, he ran back and began destroying every vial. And the two soldiers sleeping in the cages won't be waking up to see another day. Our mission is to see you and your sister out of this country and into safety as quickly as possible and an end to this military experiment. We need to find Catherine before the Russian military finds her. And I don't know what this wolf trainer thinks he's doing, but I hope he realizes how much danger they are in. Jack walked to the window and looked out at the falling snow. Where's my pack? I hadn't thought about the phone until just now. Maybe Katz tried to call me. It must still be down in the car. You didn't change back into yourself until we were already in the room and you were naked at that point. It must have come off your back when you were laying in the back seat. Jack fastened the belt on the Terry bathrobe he was wearing and went down the snowy stairs in his bare feet. The pack was on the floor in the back seat. The snow was falling on his hair and his feet felt numb. He quickly returned inside before looking for his phone. And standing by the fire, he dumped the contents of his pack on the hearth. The cell phone slid out from the bottom of the pack. The battery was dead. Damn it, do you have a phone charger? There's one in my purse. Plug it in and come to bed. I know how to warm those cold feet. Why isn't Jack picking up his phone, Catherine asked out loud as she dialed his cell phone yet again. His voicemail is full. I can't leave him a message. You can't leave him a message, Catherine. If someone else has his phone, you don't want them to know where you are. If his calls are intercepted, they'll be tracing your number and know your location. It wasn't a good idea to call him with your phone in the first place. I, I wish I would have thought of that before you made the calls, Usko replied. We'll figure out how to get a hold of your brother one way or another. For now, we need to focus on getting you strong, healthy, and in a place where you'll be safe. Please believe me, Cat. Hearing Usko call her by her nickname brought tears to her eyes. No one but her brother ever called her Cat. Hearing Usko call her by that name was endearing. Usko glanced over his shoulder. In the back seat, 
and Rebecca was curled into a furry ball. She had assumed her little fox-like wolf body and was softly snoring. Usko smiled. She sure is a happy little thing, even with all she's been through, chained up in a cage for the past week and scared half out of her wits. She's content and in good spirited. I think we should learn a few things from that little wolf. Catherine glanced back at Rebecca. The best thing about her sleeping is we get a few minutes peace. That girl never stops talking. Yeah, they both got a laugh out of that. Tell me about your childhood, Usko. When did you find out you were a werewolf? Wow, I haven't been called that in a while, Usko laughed. In Mongolia, the wolf is very sacred. Not only is it the male ancestor of the great Genghis Khan, but also the messenger of heaven, sent to punish those who disrespect the spirit masters of the land. But a conflict exists among the people of Mongolia. They honor the wolf as a spiritually powerful animal and also hate the wolf for the damage it inflicts on their livestock. Also, the wolf's connection to heaven makes its body parts profitable as an alternative medicine source. You can find wolf body parts trafficked on the black market. Every part of the wolf is worth something as a trade item. Well, wolf fur is considered to be one of the warmest furs available, and it's easy to sell. But the meat, the bones, and the internal organs are sold for their medicinal qualities, and the teeth are sold as souvenirs to tourists. Even more interesting is how the wolf can be honored or blamed for any natural occurrence. There's all kinds of superstitions regarding the wolf being the bringer of destruction. A good example of that is the thing about the Yar High tree. It's a sacred tree that herders sometimes cut down for horse whips, angering the spirits. They believe that the spirit of the mountains where these trees grow will send the wolf to punish people by eating their sheep. They call in a llama, that's a religious person similar to a priest in your country, to calm the spirits. Here's another crazy fact. In the Mongolian language, a wolf is called a chon. But if you are a wolf hunter, you must never say that name or the wolf will hear you and know you are hunting it. Herders are also afraid of calling it by name for fear that it will come and kill their sheep. They believe that the wolf's spiritual power is tied to its name. So they call it by other names rather than its true name. Names like Gray Dog or Blue Dog. There are literally hundreds of names for the wolf as Mongols do not want to anger the creature or alert it to their intentions. They also believe that if you feed your babies wolf meat, they will turn into little wolves. My transformation came about when I was a very young boy, traveling across the steppes with my mother. We were in a sledge traveling from my father's lands to my mother's people, the Nenets, whom you will soon meet. When we were attacked by a band of hungry wolves and I was bitten. I became very sick as the wolf's saliva mixed with my blood. I survived, but was forever changed into part man, part wolf. We believe in our culture that there are a few descendants of the great Genghis Khan that also have this ability, but I never have met one. That was why I was so excited about meeting you and Rebecca and Spencer. But I'm not a wolf, Catherine protested, but my brother is. I've seen him change right before my eyes. It looks like a painful process. He's come across others also, and my father is one as well. Supposedly, that is why my blood is so valuable. I carry the pure bloodline of my father, which is one of the oldest and purest bloodlines. But I've never shown any signs of being one myself. Well, I have a theory about that, Usko replied quietly. I think, with time and the right circumstances, you too will accept and assume your true form. Many will change when they feel great anger or fear, brings out the angry beast inside and triggers the transformation. But Catherine, I think you will experience the transformation when you feel great love. He looked at her and smiled. Miguel had left numerous messages on Jack's cell phone. Now the mailbox was full and would not accept any additional messages. Frustrated, Miguel threw the phone over to Julian. Where is that son of a... His words drifted off. 
as he stormed out of the room. He was worried. Not hearing from Jack was taking its toll on all of them. Julian and Juanita were arguing with each other, and Rosa was clanging pots and pans in the kitchen. Miguel walked outside and went to check on the horses. He thought about how Jack had become like a brother to him, and now Julian had asked Miguel to help him get an engagement ring for Juanita so he'd be family now. That is, if his sister accepted. He chuckled to himself at the thought of it. Juanita, it was a wild one. She'd never found a man that could make her want to settle down. But Julian, he was different. It didn't matter that he was older than she was by a good ten years or more. He was rough, feral, just her type. It made him think of the love he had lost so many years ago when he was in Brazil. He'd never tried to find another woman. Oh, he'd had his share of romance, but no one could ever hold a candle to Giselle. The night she was gunned down by the PCC was the worst night of his life. I gotta get out of this depression, he thought, as he walked into the barn and threw a leaf of hay into each stall, along with a scoop of oats and, and grain into each of the feeders and checked the water troughs. His hired man had been killed when the Russian agent stormed his hacienda. Now, he'd have to look into hiring more guys. Miguel sighed. It would soon be New Year's. He'd light a candle tonight and pray for Jack's safety. For Catherine's return. For Julian and Juanita's happiness. And for the loss of his sweet Giselle. Morning light was just beginning to pour in the bedroom window of the condo where Sasha lay sleeping. Jack got up to make coffee and unplugged his cell phone from the wall charger. He held the button down to reboot the phone. As it turned back on, it made the dinging sound, alerting him to his messages. He quickly picked up the phone and read 22 missed calls, 13 new messages. He looked at the list of missed calls. Miguel, Catherine, 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 Miguel, Catherine... He felt a wave of dizziness wash over him as his relief filled his body. She's alive, and she's able to call me. He quickly looked at his messages from her before hitting the call button. Jack, where are you? Jack, call me. Jack, I'm okay. Usko rescued us, and he's taking us. He heard a male voice say, Wait, don't say anything. Someone may have his phone. Another wave of relief. It appeared, whoever this Usko was, he seemed to be concerned with Kat's safety. Several more messages were from Miguel and Julian. Jack called Kat's number. It rang, but there was no answer. He left her a voicemail. Kat, call me back. Are you okay? He hung up, terribly disappointed that he hadn't reached her. He poured a cup of coffee, then tried again. Still no answer. Walking over to the big lounge chair, he dialed Miguel's number. Miguel was brushing his favorite mare, Kalo, when Julian walked into the barn holding Miguel's phone. Your phone's been ringing. You've got a code on it, so I couldn't answer it, but I think it was Jack. Miguel quickly looked at the missed calls. It was Jack. He pushed the buttons to return the call and heard Jack pick up the line. Brother, where the hell have you been? Are you okay, man? Miguel practically yelled into the phone. Julian stood close by, so Miguel pushed the speaker button. Julian added, have you found Catherine? She's been rescued from the laboratory, but that's about all I know, Jack responded. What laboratory? What's been going on? Well, that professor, doctor, whatever the hell he is, Luther, uh, he took her and two others to a laboratory in Russia. It's way the hell up a mountain, in some hidden location. Anyway, as far as I can tell, they were taking their blood. I have someone here helping me, Sasha, so she's got me to the facility, but when I arrived there, Kat and the others were already gone. There's a lab assistant, a guy named Usko, who is apparently a wolf trainer out of Mongolia. He took them from the facility, and we're trying to track them down. Catherine tried to call me, but I haven't been able to reach her back yet. At least we know she's okay. I think this Usko fellow is trying to rescue them from the clutches of the Russian government. But I'm not entirely certain what his motives are or if he's working for someone. We're still trying to get intel on him. Anyway, that's about all I know. 
We were so worried, brother. Is there anything we can do? Do you need me to fly over there? Miguel asked. No, stay there. It's too complicated here. Sasha and her brother are helping me find Catherine, and until we find out more about this guy who took them, or where they're headed, there's not much we can do. I'm just going to keep trying to reach her by phone. She left me several messages when I was out of cell phone range, so I know she's trying to reach me. We're at some ski resort in the mountains right now. It's storming pretty good. I think we'll probably stay put here for the time being until we know where he's taking him. At least we have good cell service here. I need to stay right by my phone. Okay, Jack, let us know as soon as you hear anything. And again, if there's anything we can do from here, we'll be waiting by our phones as well. The roads were icy underneath the fresh coating of snow. Catherine was sound asleep, leaning her head against the car window. Rebecca was still asleep in the back seat. Usko was nodding off himself, but he didn't want to risk stopping on the side of the road. He still had many miles to travel before reaching the Arctic boundary. The snow was falling and it was very hypnotizing. He slapped his cheeks and opened the window to let the frigid air in to wake him up. He couldn't sleep now. Too much risk. He had driven through the night, only taking a break for gas and a restroom break along the side of the road. But the driving was getting to him. He'd be reaching the small village soon where some of his family members stayed while others would already be on the annual migration. A few of the elders were too old to make the trip by sledge and were content to stay behind in the village, tended to by the younger women of the tribe who were with child or those who had illnesses that prevented them from joining the others. When he was this far up in the Arctic, it always felt like another world to him. The northern lights shone brilliantly overhead, and the endless snow and ice covered every inch of ground for as far as the eye could see. He loved this frozen country, but he also knew that they would be pursued endlessly. They needed to get to Finland as quickly as possible. There they would be safe. He felt the soft warmth of the reindeer hides and saw a face looming over him, whispering to him. It was his mother, and he was a boy again, sleeping in the warmth of her love. He felt the gentle rocking of his mother's arms as the car slid off the road and softly plowed into a snowbank on the side of the road. <laughs>